Good day. It's one o'clock here in Geneva, and so we begin part two of the consultation session on the framework for effectiveness evaluation of the Minamata Convention. My name is Claudia Tenhafe, and I welcome you back, many, many, many of you, to today, the second part uh, of this conversation. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I see some persons are still coming in, but uh, we wait for a moment or two and then we shall continue. Um, as you can see projected, of course, is uh, the slide that shows the invitation to this session today, as well as all of the different documentations that are background to this uh, conversation, this consultation, in fact. And may I specifically also draw your attention to the online workspace um, where you will find all the written comments that have been received so far uh, on the effectiveness evaluation framework um, uh, consultation as requested uh, as request of the secretary to request to enable um, at the end of COP 4.1. If today is the first time that you have joined um, the consultation, I shall give a little bit of background of what happened on Tuesday. But otherwise, uh, we shall proceed where we ended on Tuesday. With that, let me move to the next slide. And uh, just recall that um, uh, it was decided at COP 4.1 to do something new in the convention, uh, ability to come together and work on on uh, how to enable its work best, and that is to have a time in between COP 4.1, the online session, and COP 4.2, the in-person session that will be convening in Bali in March. Um, and this on this intersessional consultation is to enable parties to look at uh, outstanding and remaining issues that are related to the item of effectiveness evaluation. We had um, set up that the consultation session would run over three days, two sessions over three days, part one on Tuesday that concluded on the 25th. And today we are here for part two of the consultation session. Um, and just as mentioned, there is the online workspace. So uh, for you to uh, find all of the contributions that have been written, uh, that have been presented to us and submitted to us. Just to recall that the aim of the consultations is to use this little bit of extra time in between and in the run up to COP 4.2. In fact, today is day 52. We have 52 days until COP 4 uh, resumes as the in, in person segment in Bali. Um, and one of the important items um, at this time in this timeline of the convention is to give full effect to uh, Article 22, given that there is specific text, as many of you know, as all of you know, about beginning the first effectiveness uh, evaluation uh, six years after giving effect uh, for the convention to come into force, and that deadline is in 2023. Before I go to the next slide, may I just ask my colleague if the slide could be made bigger? As we move forward, perhaps it's just on my side that I see the slide smaller, but if it's just on my side, we will just continue. But I trust that all those present can see the slide well and the details on the slide. If you could maybe just indicate in the chat that it is indeed visible. And uh, I shall proceed. I see some th thumbs up. Okay, very good. We go to the next slide. And just to recall that following COP 4.1, the Secretariat put together a plan of work for the consultations uh, with four broad uh, steps or milestones. The first was in December to give background information in an information session on the status of work so far, but also on uh, the consultations that you are now conducting. Um, then by the 20th of January, written comments were invited 
from all those uh, that would like to contribute those and we have received some as you know and now we are in the golden section which is indeed the consultation time following the consultation time and to support the parties um, the secretariat would put together the information um, and make it available for parties in their preparation for this agenda item at COP 4.2. Moving to the next item, the next slide. Just to recall that when we came together on Tuesday, we had received uh, written comments from the following eight parties. We received written comments from Kuwait, from Mauritius, from Omar, from the uh, EU and its member states, from Japan, from the UK, from America, and also comments specifically on indicators from Iran. Next slide. And to recap, in case you were not with us on Tuesday, or if you, uh, just to recap again where we were, um, we began uh, with a background on the consultations and specifically the references to the document 18418, which sets out where the Secretariat sets out all the mandates um, that the COP has so far put together and with it the work that has accumulated already over these past years, over COP1, COP2, COP3, um, in fulfillment towards giving effect to Article 22. Um, these mandates are, uh, sit, are set out uh, and in there is a table, uh, which I will speak to more in a moment, uh, which shows you the areas of work that have uh, already made, seen great progress and also those areas of work where there is still some work to be done. Um, additionally, um, there is also the uh, CRP1 that uh, we would like to draw your attention to. It is our first conference room paper and it is the product of consultations by Canada and Norway in the time leading between COP3 and COP4 uh, to try to uh, address specifically areas of work that were not included in decision 310. Those were the other areas of work on effectiveness evaluation and with the aim of supporting countries uh, to come together and be able to in fact uh, launch the first effectiveness evaluation uh, for the convention. So these two documents are key documents uh, for the discussion on framework. Having said that, there are many others, of course, as those documents reference. Um, furthermore, uh, on uh, Tuesday, um, uh, just to outline uh, the comments received uh, from um, Kuwait, Mauritius and Oman were general and supportive comments and comments of commitments and then specific comments to parts uh, of the framework and uh, related matters were also submitted by the United States, by Japan, by the United Kingdom and the European Union and its member states and their uh, Liz Nichols for the United States and Toshi uh, Yamazaki, Yamizaki for uh, Japan, Matt Lovett for uh, United Kingdom and Lorna Shu for the European Union and the and its member states presented their written comments. Um, we did not on Tuesday uh, get around to look at the comments on indicators uh, from Iran, uh, but we had the opportunity to listen to uh, two contributions uh, by our Iranian colleagues, uh, both Mr. Abbas and uh, Ambassador Nazril, um, additional oral comments that were given during that session. And then just um, just as I only learned afterwards that you were not able to see the widespread of people that had dialed in for this consultation, um, we are pleased to let you know that uh, 34 parties were present, um, which is uh, very, very encouraging indeed and shows the breadth of interest of all regions um, in this matter and in these consultations. We were also happy to see some uh, non-party states participate and 14 um, stakeholder organizations uh, were also present. With this as background, let me go to the next slide. And uh, just to update that in the interim, um, we have also received, in addition to the ones I've already outlined, we've received comments um, from uh, China on the use of modeling and data quality. 
And again, all of the comments received in writing are available on our online workspace. The next slide, basically, this you have seen before, just puts us all on the same page of what needs to be done, what needs to be completed, or what where does the COP need to, uh, why is the COP considering effectiveness evaluation at COP 4.2? And the long and the short of it is indeed the deadline coming up, the deadline of um, putting in place the arrangements to begin the first effectiveness evaluation no later than six years after the date of entry into force of the convention. And that would be uh, indeed uh, next year, in August next year. And thus, as we are meeting this year, it is the pivotal time uh, to make this important step. And again, here you just see the two documents I already mentioned, 418 and also CRP1. So with the next slide, just to recall that in document 418, um, where it gives you a number of uh, much information on the work that has been mandated by a decision 310 in terms of the work intercessionally between COP3 and COP4, there's also a table um, at the conclusion of the document that sets out, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, the mandates that have been accumulated and also the work that has been done and has organized it um, under these um, eight areas of work. And um, the next slide, just to recall, is that the CRP that has been developed uh, by Norway and uh, Canada following a wide consultation process and based, uh, of course, also on the work that has been proceeding, including what had been presented and worked on during um, COP3. Um, and this work includes and uh, represented schematically here also the terms of reference, proposed terms of reference for the Effectiveness Evaluation Committee and proposed terms of reference for a science body, a science group, um, of advice um, that in this particular paper is termed the SAGE. And then moving on, today um, we are here for the second part of the consultations. And just to recall that the consultations are very much to allow parties to present um, their comments. Uh, they also to allow for additional comments to be made. Um, and also and particularly important is to allow parties to clarify comments that um, and clarify any particular information points that they might hear from other parties um, and also to ask additional questions or um, additional matters um, that, that are important for the uh, preparation of all parties on this um, item. Overall, it is our hope as Secretariat to be able to support you now in this time, this little bit of extra time um, so that you can um, uh, have the preparations at hand and be able to begin um, the hard work um, and the final work um, as soon as we get to the opening of COP 4.2. And may I just uh, underline that it is, of course, um, an opportunity to share information, uh, perspectives, uh, or any insights. This is not a negotiation, it is a consultation, um, and it is uh, very much um, hoped that um, uh, there could also, of course, be this opportunity uh, and uh, ability for, for parties to really hear each other's perspectives deeply and with a little bit more time than is uh, sometimes possible in a strict COP setting. With that, um, I just want to look if I have, if there's any comment or anything I need to take account of or any hand up, but I think that is okay. With that, I would perhaps like to propose that for the next 80 minutes um, that we have here together, that we could look at the time structured in the following way. Um, on Tuesday, we ran up the entire 90 minutes with um, the presentations, the very uh, rich representations and um, also some additional comments. And so first I would like to perhaps offer um, the opportunity for any additional information 
um, that any of the presenters might have liked to add additional uh, to what they uh, what they said on Tuesday to add it now or and or for any questions that um, some others may have wanted to make to the presentations of Tuesday to have that opportunity to to have uh, that uh, interaction now and after that um, if if indeed um, uh, if this would be feasible for you as well um, I'd like to propose that since um, Written comments have also been received by Iran on indicators specifically, and also by China on um, on information um, that uh, there may be it may be very opportune to have these two um, comments, written comments, also presented, and thereafter to go into further considerations, um, as uh, as of course this room sees fit given the con the, the discussions. If this meets your broad agreement, um, and unless I see another, unless there's any other advice or request I see or can recognize from the floor, I would like to perhaps begin with this and, um, and ask first if there was any other matter that any of the presenters perhaps wanted to add or make clearer um, at uh, given their presentations on Tuesday. If I'm not mistaken, Japan wanted to perhaps add a bit of information. Um, if I could look into the room and perhaps Yes, <laughs> Toshi Yoshizaki, please go ahead. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, I'm Hito Shi from the Ministry of the Environment, Japan. I, I'm afraid I made a quite lengthy presentation on Tuesday, but I want to add one thing. Uh, since I'm afraid uh, I my presentation might have led some misunderstanding on the timeline, uh, the Japan prefers. Uh, it may be understood, misunderstood that uh, Japan supports the effectiveness evaluation to be conducted every four years. But uh, our uh, intention was that the, the first cycle of the effectiveness evaluation would conclude in 2025. Uh, that means uh, almost four years cycle of the first uh, effectiveness evaluation. And then uh, for some time, uh, we need to to reflect upon the, the lessons learned from the first uh, exercise and consider uh, any the room of improvement of, for example, a national reporting format or guidance or even the framework itself. So uh, we need some interval uh, period to, between the first uh, ev evaluation and the second evaluation. And probably it would be good to coincide with the uh, uh, timeline of the national reporting to be conducted every four years. So uh, my intention was uh, four years uh, effective evaluation plus four years interval in total uh, eight years uh, overall cycle. Uh, that's our intention. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, and I think that is also very valuable uh, information on the periodicity of the uh, effectiveness evaluation cycle because indeed that is requested by the um, convention text that in addition to putting in place the arrangements to conduct its first effectiveness evaluation, the uh, COP is also to, de to decide on how often to do effectiveness evaluations um, and so this information is very, uh, very helpful. Uh, thank you very much. 
May I just, um, perhaps if there was any other matter that any of the other speakers or parties that had presented would like to add um, that they felt they want from Tuesday, I would be happy to um, give you the floor. Um, but if I don't see a request for that, um, let me then perhaps open the floor more generally uh, for any questions that um, that any of those presents have, having listened to the presentations on Tuesday. And um, if I may ask you to identify yourself, um, well, firstly, if I may ask you to raise your hand, the easiest way to raise your hand is to um, put your mouse over your name and you should see a little hand button to press. So if I am correct, I seem to be told that Jesus Lopez would like to take the floor. And just for everybody to know uh, each other, may I invite uh, those that are asking some questions just to shortly introduce who they are. Please, over to you, Mr. Lopez. Maybe there is a technical issue. Let's look at that. But I thought I saw another raised hand. Was there any other question or clarification? If not, if not, unless I see um, the hand of Mr. Abbas Tuabi of Iran, is that indeed an indication of wanting to speak? In which case, please proceed. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? I, yes, I can hear you very well. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Claudia, and good, mo uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in the in last uh, meeting, online meeting of Tuesday, we made some observations about uh, effectiveness evaluations framework, our view on that, uh, and we emphasized that we will uh, send and submit our uh, uh, more specific uh, uh, ideas and views regarding this uh, framework. Uh, we are still working on that. I uh, explained some elements on that. Just uh, here, uh, I want to uh, explain two points regarding this, this framework, uh, particularly about uh, uh, effectiveness evaluation committee and uh, uh, scientific advisory group that as, as explained and as clarified in submission of Canada and Norway. Uh, we think that those two bodies uh, can be in different way and the terms of uh, uh, reference and a structure of those groups can be made in another way. Uh, uh, so we will give more explanations about that in our own uh, proposal later. Uh, we think that, uh, but generally if I want to explain some uh, uh, something about our own ideas regarding those two bodies, we think that the effectiveness evaluation committee uh, needs to be more uh, representative uh, and uh, more uh, uh, more member. The membership should should be more broad and more uh, uh, people should be in this committee. And also about scientific advisory group, we think that uh, its structure can be uh, in the form of a meeting, open ended. Uh, meeting uh, so all scientific experts can go uh, can participate in that and uh, present their uh, and discuss about the way forward how they can uh, 
uh, plan uh, about the works uh, that will be in their homeworks and how they can proceed. First of all, all uh, there should be opportunity for all uh, parties to participate in an open-ended meeting, and then they can design and, uh, 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 and uh, make decision about the structure of such body. Uh, so this is just some uh, general ideas. We will give more explanation and more specification about our own ideas. And regarding uh, indicators, we have uh, submitted our uh, 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 our written comments. Uh, just I want to explain a little bit about that. Uh, uh, re regarding uh, the Article 1, we have said that uh, the uh, parties, uh, parties uh, data should not just be limited to uh, uh, the parties of the convention. Also, Non-parties uh, data is important about some uh, sub, uh, emission and release, and it should be included in uh, creating any attributive modeling. And also uh, regarding different clusters, uh, we have uh, made a comment uh, uh, in the indicators that uh, the supportive uh, supportive articles should be mentioned in these uh, indicators. Uh, we want to emphasize the relationships uh, between uh, the technical articles and also supportive articles, I mean uh, articles 13 and 14. So we have uh, for the, uh, for the uh, in, uh, these indicators uh, in different articles, we have proposed the number and uh, proportion of parties that have received and uh, request the technical assistance and financial support uh, for implementation of the provisions under different art, uh, different clusters to be ex uh, to be included uh, we know that uh, for uh, technical and scientific uh, cluster there is a, a special cluster but we want to uh, uh, we want by inclusion of uh, those uh, supportive proposal in this uh, in every uh, cluster we want to make more uh, emphasize and highlight this issue because we believe that the obliga obligations of the countries is particularly developing countries is very dependent to the technical uh, assistance and also for uh, financial assistance that they are urgently needed uh, uh, we also have some uh, uh, ambiguity about the source of uh, some information, for instance, uh, for Article 3, uh, the source of uh, one of the source of uh, uh, information uh, is a report of uh, global mercury supply, trade and demand in 2017. We don't know what report does it mean and uh, how credible is it, it is. So we need some clarification about that if uh, there is a discussion regarding this uh, uh, source of information. Of course, this is not just our uh, the only ambiguity in some other source of information. We have uh, such ambiguities and need clarifications. And uh, I think uh, all, uh, the other point that we uh, have included in the indicators uh, is regarding the uh, scientific, uh, scientific. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, financial mechanism in Article 14 uh, regarding GF that uh, we have proposed that the number of parties that have not uh, received or uh, not been able to receive the financial mechanism, financial resources uh, uh, be included in this uh, uh, indicator. Because many parties have requested for financial uh, resources, but, uh, but for any reason, they, ha uh, they have not been able to receive that. So uh, we have proposed that in, uh, for Article 14. So uh, those were some uh, general explanation uh, about our uh, proposals regarding indicators. And uh, I will stop by here and uh, will, uh, would like to listen more, uh, more question if uh, any of the participants have regarding our proposals. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Torabi. Um, and thank you for taking us uh, specifically also into your written uh, comments. If I may just sum up, uh, because you made a number of comments. First, you gave some more clarity from the government of Iran's perspective on the two bodies that are being proposed, namely on the Effectiveness Evaluation Committee. Um, you made the comment that the government of, of Iran uh, considers it to be necessary to look at the representation of that body and to be uh, broad. Secondly, you also spoke to the proposed SAGE, uh, the group, the, the science group, and uh, mentioned that um, the structure would need to be looked at to allow uh, wide participation. Um, you put forward the idea of the opportunity to participate in an open-ended meeting to design uh, the structure of such a body. You then went on to explain the submission, and thank you very much for doing that. Uh, the submission received by Iran is on the proposed indicators, and you summarized uh, very uh, well uh, the areas that Iran has pointed out, namely, on the one hand, um, to make a comment that, uh, that of course, the data from non-parties uh, would also have to be included for proper attributive uh, measures and modeling. Uh, you also secondly spoke to the link between the so-called control measures, the technical uh, articles, and also the supportive articles, um, and the need uh, for that link to be clear. Um, and thirdly, you um, uh, you outlined, and it's also clear in the written submission, um, you uh, requested more information on uh, some of the proposed sources of information, whether it's Article 3, that is the trade one, I believe, um, and uh, also uh, some others, um, and you uh, requested just some you requested some information of the use or the rationale for use of some of the proposed sources. And lastly, you um, highlighted, uh, as it is also in the submission, uh, the matter of the indicators around the financial mechanism and pointed out that um, there may be parties that have not yet received their support uh, they would like to uh, from um, part of the financial mechanism and um, uh, alerted to that uh, need to bring that information forward. I hope I have summarized all of this uh, appropriately. Um, and may I perhaps now open the floor? Thank you very much. May I perhaps now open the floor and just to check if there are any direct or immediate responses or requests for clarifications or additional comments that anybody would have for Mr. Torabi of Iran based on the written submission um, presented by Mr. Torabi. Do I see any hands up? I don't believe I see any. Um, let me just check one more time. Um, but um, I do see a hand, and if I may call on uh, Lorna Sho of the EU and its member states, please, over to you. Good afternoon and good evening to everybody. My question is actually not to Iran. So if I'm in the wrong place, Claudia, then please uh, allow me to wait. Uh, it is to some of the other comments uh, which came in yesterday. Should I wait? Uh, thank you. Um, well, perhaps in perhaps what we should, could then do is just uh, go on to the um, to, for me to be able to invite the representative of China to present their comments, and then perhaps we could open it up again um, because then the full written comments would have been presented. Would that be agreeable to you, Lorna? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Very fine. Great. And if I may ask, um, if I may actually call on Ms. Yunfang Hu, 
Um, as we also have a contribution received, and thank you very much uh, for sending that, if perhaps you could speak to the written submission from the government of China. Over to you. Are you able to unmute yourself? I don't hear you yet. Uh, this time. Yes, um, yes. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, China, after China appreciates this opportunity to listen to other parties' opinions and also share with you our comment. We acknowledge that effective evaluation is an important tool for us to learn what we have achieved and what remains to be done under the Convention, which is, of course, very important to all parties. As you see on the slide, these are the comments we submitted to the Secretariat in Britain. We mainly focus on the application of modeling in effective evaluation and data quality. First, about modeling, we are concerned that current modeling of environmental impact of mercury still remains immature and not suitable to be applied in effective evaluation at this stage. Second, about data quality. According to Article 22 on effective evaluation, what should be provided is comparable monitoring data. We believe such comparable monitoring data should be defined clearly in the guidance and follow well-documented quality assurance and quality control control procedures approved by the EC or SAGE. You could find more details on this in the document. Mm. Also, except for what I introduced just now, we would like to take this opportunity to raise several specific questions on the CRP, especially on related institutional arrangements. Mm, COP3 slash 14 serves as a basis for our work in effectiveness evaluation arrangement after COP3. This document presents to establish the EEC and the monitoring group while the CRP proposes to establish the EEC and the scientific advisory group on effectiveness evaluation. We noted there were some differences in the terms of reference, tasks, and membership in the two documents. It will be helpful if we could get clarification on the following issues. Um, first, about the role of the Secretariat. In figure two and paragraph 67 to 69 in Annex two of top three slash 14, the Secretariat should compile four reports. Number one, synthesis report resulting from article 13, 14, and 15 mandated by the convention, including reports on the view of the finance mechanism, reports on capacity building and technical assistance, and reports from the implementation and compliance committee. Number two, the article 21 synthesis report. Number three, the emissions and releases report. And number four, the trade supply and demand report. But we noted that the first synthesis report, which is about financial mechanism, capacity building, is not mentioned in both 
the text and figure two of the CRP. Um, second about SAGE. In the CRP, one task of SAGE is to develop a scientific report which compiles analysis and synthesizes comparable mercury monitoring data and draw conclusions. What are the differences between the scientific reports and the monitoring reports presented in Figure 2 in COP3-14? And what is the relationship between the scientific report and the attribution report? One of the tasks of SAGE is to provide input and uh, advice to the Secretariat in developing the emissions and releases in the in that inventory. What is the relationship between the emissions and releases inventory and the data obtained from monitoring in accordance with the guidance guideline on monitoring? Third, about the overall roadmap. EC, SAGE, and the Secretariat are responsible for different report preparation. It is suggested to put forward a complete roadmap for effectiveness evaluation and uh, clarify the schedule respectively so as to grasp the overall EE progress. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, both for the presentation of the written comments received, but also for these additional, and I must say in each case, pertinent questions. Um, if, I, if I may, uh, just to uh, recall that uh, you outlined uh, the written comments put forward by the government on China, of China, specifically on the application of modeling and also some comments specifically put forward on data quality um, and you specifically outlined that on data quality since it is comparable data that is to be used that um, the quality control is uh, pertinent and would have to be um, set uh, and approved by the effectiveness evaluation committee and sage um, you also, um, but, but all the detail is uh, specifically in this written um, written submission. Uh, China then went on, Monsieur then went on to raise some questions, and if I can try to um, summarize them, um, there was a question in terms of some differences in perhaps representation are in one document of what the uh, effectiveness evaluation committee and the monitoring group would do as opposed to how it was put forward in another. And so China would like to see some clarity there. This refers uh, in one way also to the role of the secretariat and also to the reports that are foreseen to be uh, compiled. Um, China mentioned that in one of the, rep the reports, let me outline are, of course, uh, the, the, that in the, the, the earlier document, it also mentioned um, the report on the financial mechanism cap, uh, on capacity building and the ICC. And then there is the report foreseen, the Article 21 National Reports, that is synthesis report, the um, emissions and releases report, and the trade and supply report. And uh, it was noted by China that the report of financial mechanism and capacity building is not mentioned. Um, may I also uh, just uh, recall that it was mentioned um, that uh, there was a question of uh, the exact relationship between uh, the um, scientific report and the attribution report. Um, and there was a question on the um, emissions and releases um, inventories. And lastly, 
um, there was the um, note made that it is important to have an overall uh, roadmap uh, to see what the entire endeavor of effectiveness evaluation is doing to be able to see its progress and to uh, have the overall view of what the proposed EEC, the Effectiveness Evaluation Committee, the policy uh, focused work versus the SAGE, the scientific focus work, and also the secretariat, uh, your support uh, to this process. I, I hope I have um, highlighted appropriately the questions. Um, but uh, please do correct me, but perhaps may I turn to the room because these are probably questions that many other parties um, have uh, perspectives on um, and are also thinking about in their own contexts. So if I could invite you either, if you would like to already pick up one uh, of these items mentioned um, by Yu Feng Yu, um, then um, please feel free. And I think I do see a hand, and in fact, by Norway, of course, one of the uh, proponents of that particular CRP. So may I give the floor to you, please? I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, Joel, very well. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you very much, and and thank you to everybody for the really constructive comments that uh, you have provided. Um, it has really given us uh, some perspective on the work that we have been doing with Canada <clears throat> to to get this feedback uh, on the level of detail that we have. And this is really I have first a general observation, and then I'd like to answer some of the the questions that. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, were uh, posed by uh, our Chinese colleagues. So first of all, uh, I'd like to just make an observation that comparing the discussion that has been taking place today and on Tuesday, um, we have moved to uh, a rather uh, higher level of detail than what we had at COP3. And, and this is really encouraging to me. Um, it seems there is wide convergence on, on elements of the framework, reports, timelines, and bodies. And we have moved from discussing whether we should include them or not to the specifics of those elements. And I think that is very, very good to hear. And so, <clears throat> as you all understand, as a policy evaluation uh, that is based on scientific data and uses scientific methods for analysis, um, it becomes a, a, a real question of what level of detail should be decided in which forum. <clears throat> and we are now approaching the COP in which we have to put in place the framework and the terms of references uh, of, the, of the bodies proposed therein. Um, but the bodies in themselves, hopefully, will have the role of, of specifying and further refining many of the specific elements uh, that also our colleague from China has mentioned. As you know, the, the supplementary material of the monitoring guidance has just come out for comments. And I think a lot of the specifics of the quality assurance and control measures that was mentioned um, very well fit in there. Um, and this process is certainly uh, to proceed also hopefully after COP 4.2. Um, by the production of, of first plans and then products of the of the reports uh, uh, that are mentioned in the in the framework. And I do think that this discussion that we're now having on this level of detail highlights the importance uh, of, of having opportunities for parties to give input on these details throughout the process um, because we might not be able to agree on all of them in the upcoming COP. Um, so that was the, the general uh, comment that I had. Um, I, I'm also going to try to answer some of the specific questions that were posed by China. And, and first of all, to tackle this question about the uh, s sort of missing reports about the financial mechanism and, and reports from the ICC um, compared with, with our proposal. Um, I, I assume you are referring to figure two, the framework institutional arrangements of MC3 slash 10. And indeed, 
it mentions reports from Minamata Convention processes. So those reports, um, as far as I understand, are to be produced in any case uh, in other processes of the uh, Minamata Convention. And then these are fed into through the Secretariat um, into the Effectiveness Evaluation uh, Committee and the final report. And as such, we, we did not see them as end reports in themselves, but rather information sources to be used in the effectiveness evaluation. We have by no means intended to omit these information sources. We do still think they should be included very much so, but since they are not uh, a unique product produced by the effectiveness evaluation process, um, we, we might have forgotten to include them in the picture. That's not to say that they, they couldn't be included there. Now, I hope that answers the first question. Now, secondly, um, there was a question about the uh, differences between the scientific group that we are proposing and the monitoring group that I believe was called the monitoring and modeling group um, in MC3 slash 10. Um, and as we have presented in, in previous meetings, um, having gone through the process of developing the monitoring guidance, um, at least we have come to realize that uh, the scientific element uh, of, of this evaluation really can't be reduced to either monitoring or modeling for that, that sake, but rather a combination of the two and also um, <clears throat> the inclusion of, of other kinds of scientific data um, that is used as the basis of some of the analysis, including um, on emissions and releases. And so because of this, um, we have written uh, the body as a scientific advisory group uh, rather than a monitoring and modeling group. And because of this, we have also um, incorporated or included uh, what would have been in the monitoring and modeling report into one report as they support each other. Um, I think this is reflected in the sub objectives that have been refined in the uh, monitoring guidance um, where, where the overall policy questions are divided into more, um, more, more um, refined or more easily answered scientific questions relating to the presence of mercury, the trends of mercury, its spatial distribution, and, and the potential uh, attribution uh, of, of observed mercury to different sources. And, and this, is the, this is the main difference um, here. Um, <clears throat> and finally, uh, I, I'd like to just comment uh, on, on, on the data quality and uh, maturity or immaturity of models. And, and we agree very much that comparable data should be used for the effectiveness evaluation. But I think also in the process of developing the monitoring guidance, we have come to realize that from a science perspective, there is really never a model that is good enough. And, and there is also very rarely data that is, is good enough, but it's rather a, a question of the quality um, of data or a said model. Um, and so the question is not really that black and white and, and from our perspective and what we have tried to write into the terms of reference of the SAGE is really that they should highlight the quality of both the data and the performed analysis um, so that any interpretation can be taken, uh, uh, can take into account the inherent uncertainty that exists with all data and for that matter all data analysis and modeling. Um, and, and we believe that this, this hopefully is, is a way to proceed um, in, in a transparent manner where, where we don't draw too far going conclusions based on too uncertain data, but still present that for consideration um, so that we can, in the best possible way, uh, assess how well the convention is doing as a whole. So I, I hope that this answered some of the, the specific questions and, and also thank you once again for for this very constructive comments from from everybody, uh, uh, not the least our Chinese colleagues, we would very much like to hope to continue this discussion um, <clears throat> in in the upcoming COP, and and we hope that that's um, 
let's say, not, not the end, but the beginning of, of defining a lot of these details in the ensuing process um, with the plans and, and the different elements of the effective acceleration. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, um, for those uh, those contributions. I see uh, we have a couple of other hands up. So if I may actually call also on Alison Dixon, of course, of Canada. Please, Alison, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, and hello, everybody. We in Canada really appreciate this session that uh, the Secretariat has organized and we find it very helpful to be able to hear comments and be able to think more on the CRP that we have worked on with Norway. Now we, of course, um, right now in Canada, it's very early in the morning, so our brains are not working as well as our colleague in Norway. Uh, we would like to request that uh, if you have questions, you could also send them to the Secretariat, perhaps, and we will be very happy to provide uh, further details in writing so that they can then be put on the online space so everybody can see them. I just also wanted to add to my colleague Joel's response um, about your first question uh, uh, on uh, the reports on financial mechanism and capacity building. We had originally included that in figure two on the very left hand side of the drawing, but we found that it was getting a bit too busy. And in fact, we had some uh, helpful suggestions to perhaps simplify that diagram because if the diagram had been too busy, people were getting scared. And so we tried to make this as simple as possible to highlight the new work that would need to be done by the EEC and the SAGE, as well as the Secretariat, so that we have a focus on the actual framework process and products itself. And uh, yes, we, we do look forward to having further discussions, uh, even past this session, uh, we're very happy to engage more with uh, any of you who, who wants to have discussions with Norway and Canada. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that as well. And let me look into the room whether we have um, more hands up, and indeed I, I see another hand up. Please, uh, Rogers Anka from the United States, the floor is yours. Rogers, are you able to unmute your microphone? Uh, may I perhaps ask my colleagues if they could? Can you hear me now? Yes, it's open. Okay. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to address this, and thank you to our colleagues for a very good discussion. Um, I wanted to make an emphasis on a point that was made earlier about the role of the SAGE and the EEC in terms of looking at the quality of the data and making decisions. I think one important point that gets missed a lot when we talk about where the monitoring guidance has been and is going is that the role of the guidance is to be of assistance to parties, not to be a regulatory mechanism. And so with that in mind, what we are actually looking for and encouraging is that the review of data and the use of data be viewed as a way of identifying what data is available what the quality is, what else needs to be known about that, but not to use the work of those bodies as limiting factors on what data gets used for the effectiveness. So I just wanted to make that point because, again, that is a point that seems to be getting missed a lot. Thank you. 
thank you very much for that point. And just to recall, even in the Secretariat, we have um, conversations, of course, about the meaning of the word guidance as opposed to guidelines and so on. So this is possibly a very important um, and not at all just a semantic part uh, to recall. So thank you very much for that. And if I look into the room, I, I see more hands up and um, Lorna, I didn't come back to you immediately. So if I may uh, offer the floor to you now, Lorna Show, EU and its member states, please. Thank you very much and uh, no problem at all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, my name is Lorna and some of you know I'm from the cold north in Denmark, but I'm speaking on behalf of EU and its member states. Uh, we do have some questions uh, with respect to the written comments and the presentations from uh, the other day. Uh, and I think they are actually in line with some of the comments which has already been given today uh, in this very good exchange of views, uh, which we do very much appreciate. Um, First of all, we do have some uh, questions uh, with respect to some of the comments on uh, the emission and release uh, report, uh, inventory. In some of the com comments, it's a summary of available emission and releases data. Uh, our question is actually in line, uh, along the line, which was, I think, also addressed by China in that sense that uh, what we had original on the table and which we were going to work on when we developed the effectiveness evaluation would be uh, a, a report conducted by the secretariat by a consultant uh, as many other reports uh, and in in line with what we also get from our global mercury assessment uh, we could use those data in our uh, assessment of the effectiveness of the uh, convention. Uh, now we see uh, other ways of actually addressing this where it more becomes like it's a scientific group to look into it, to give input. And we are actually wondering which data are we talking about? What uh, additional things, uh, not things, sorry, elements do we think that could come besides those which could be conducted by the secretariat so in that sense why is this new it, it looks like a more emission release cluster which we are putting into this scientific group uh, which we had hoped actually could be more slim effective and give a very first uh, reaction to the effectiveness uh, of the convention uh, that said as well uh, as was said by Japan in, in the start of this meeting, uh, we see effectiveness evaluation as well as a process. What we develop now, of course, will need to be adjusted. We will learn, hopefully we will learn. We all learn all the time. So this is not set in stone. So this about having some periodicity where we do have the possibility of looking into what we have developed. So instead of setting in stone, these big arrangements, which we can see in some of the proposals, we are still uh, wondering how they should be working and, and, and what is the purpose and, and why is what we can get from the report not enough. That's one question. And the other question is actually also been addressed already. Uh, we have some challenges in still understanding uh, the different uh, plans for monitoring data compilation summary and plans for data, data analysis and monitoring data summary and so on and so on. What are these different plans, reports, summaries? Uh, how does they fit into uh, developing a report which could go into the effectiveness evaluation committee so that they can make the assessment in the end. So those two questions is where we are at the time being. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lorna, you've raised two 
questions. The one on emissions and releases report, uh, perhaps it's become bigger now as a cluster, and the other is to understand better the um, monitoring data. Um, let me leave that in the room, and may I perhaps invite um, as next speak as next raised hand. I actually had Terry Keating of the United States. If I could, uh, if I could give you the floor, please. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to ad address. Um, a couple of things. Um, one, the issue of of data quality that that China has raised, and um, then I'd also like to respond to um, the points that um, the EU and member states just raised with uh, emissions and and plans. Um, first, I, I want to thank China for their very useful comments about quality assurance and support. Um, the explanation that Joel um, it, uh, presented from Norway. The, the monitoring guidance, the, the issues of quality assurance, what, what we have suggested um, at this point um, in the monitoring guidance process is that we develop a system of what we refer to as data flags, um, where we can include um, data in a data set, um, but we can include with that information on the quality of the data and the criteria for those different flags. Um, uh, China has actually in their written comments provided several, um, uh, several criteria that would be very useful as, as data flags. Um, and this would allow very transparently to decide in any particular um, statistical analysis or modeling analysis of the data uh, to make a decision about which data you're including based on those on those flags. Um, and but this doesn't exclude then participation in the overall process or um, exclude information that might be useful, even though highly uncertain. So um, one of the things that we want to make sure is that we're not telling countries that are just beginning to monitor mercury that we're not going to look at the information that they produce until they reach a certain level of quality. Um, we think that sends the wrong message. Um, and from a scientific perspective, leaves information that could be useful, even though highly uncertain, leaves it out of the process. And we don't want to do that. And so we think that the suggestions that have been made about quality are really important and really useful and should be incorporated into this data flagging approach, which is something that we expected to be explored in the supplemental materials um, for the monitoring guidance and need to continue to be developed um, in the coming months, um, probably beyond 4.2. Um, going to the, the question of, of the emissions, um, the, the concept of developing an emissions inventory simply from compiling um, national data. Uh, we know from experience, um, not only with the Global Mercury Assessment, but also from many other conventions that work with emissions data, that when you pull emissions data from multiple countries, um, you're, and you try to, to summarize that, you're going to find data gaps. And those data gaps have to be filled by someone. And in the case of the Global Mercury Assessment, um, those data gaps were filled by the consultant that was hired. Um, but choices have to be made in, in filling those gaps. And, and we think that in this process, that those choices should be informed by a broader process, not just simply by sending that off to a consultant, 
and asking them to do their best job that they can, but through a process where other experts get to look at those choices and get to look at the decisions that are, are being made. Um, in particular for Mercury, one of the, the issues is that it's not simply the anthropogenic sources that are considered under the convention. There are other sources of emissions that need to be taken into account in, in trying to understand the ambient observations um, and, and including natural sources. And so those are things that are, are going to require scientific and expert input. It's also a question of this integration of information that needs some interplay between um, the monitoring emissions and modeling expertise to make sure that we have information that that can be brought together uh, across that in order to make these decisions about about attribution of change, what caused the change that we observe in, in the environment. So that's that's the issue of of emissions is that we see that there needs to be some interaction and it's not simply a report that can be contracted out that there needs to be um, it, it is a scientific process and there needs to be some dialogue and opportunity for experts from countries to participate in that. And this gets to the issue of plans. Um, so one concern that we heard in in various um, dialogues about the effectiveness evaluation is uh, how people can participate. And in one of the concerns that that people have is that if you're not a member, if you're not a don't have a seat at the table as part of the SAGE or as part of the EEC, then you don't get an opportunity to comment and provide information until the report's been written and 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 the work has been done and it's very difficult to go back. And so the something that we've really um, supported is this two stage process of being very transparent about what the plan is, where where the data is going to come from, what analysis is planning to be done and how that's going to be carried out and do that first, make that available to folks and make it available so people can comment on it. Then do the work um, based with, with input from the parties from those comments. Do the work, come back with the conclusions and share those um, with the parties. And this does make the process long. And that's why I think it's been envisioned as a four year process and not simply a two year process. Um, but our idea is to create as much transparency and opportunity for participation from parties um, so that that this truly reflects the the members uh, views um, when and and it represents more of a consensus when the work is finalized and we come to a conclusion together. So I want to thank everyone for their comments. Uh, um, as as Joel and, and Allison pointed out earlier, I think that um, the conversation has really progressed and I'm very excited to see us talking more at a, at a detailed level. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Terry, um, you you took us carefully through some very important considerations, including on choices and how to make choices. That choices need to be made. The importance of both process and transparency, and also, of course, uh, the importance of inclusion, um, be it in a formal membership setting or be it in um, the a two step process for commenting and really integrating um, any other um, perspective that uh, or other information that that needs to be. Thank you very much for that. 
I see a number of other hands and there were also some questions that crisscrossed and if I'm not mistaken, Joel of Norway has his hand up again. So um, unless I've mistaken, may I give the, the, the floor to Joel? Thank, thank you, Claudia, and, and also thank you, Terry, for that explanation. Um, <clears throat> I, I just had very brief comments. Um, to, to put it really simply, to answer Luna's question about the difference in the secretariat and a consultant doing the emissions and releases inventory versus what we have envisioned, it, it's not really about what is done if the model uh, is the GMA. It's just that what we are proposing is to include uh, a broader set of, of experts and that opportunity for comment. So perhaps I was repeating what Terry said, but I, I think that's that's the short answer. And then <clears throat> about this plants and products, um, I think Terry gave a very good explanation. I just wanted to add to that, that I, I do understand also the concern that this can be done to an excess and, and there can be, um, uh, you know, it can be done in two small increments. I think the what we have learned from the monitoring guidance process is that it's very good to have uh, frequent interaction, but also that it would be important to um, to have set deadlines for uh, for commenting periods from parties, where preferably. Um, all of the proposed plans as, as much as possible could be sent out for comments simultaneously and that there would be enough time for, for parties to uh, consult all the experts in their own organizations uh, to give proper answers. Because I, I do understand if, if some of the concern from, from my EU colleagues has been that we don't want to create a too heavy process here. Um, I, I think that is important to keep in mind and, and hopefully can be uh, addressed by by having um, clear deadlines um, and deliveries uh, and, and a predetermined plan for for when the comments are asked and, and when they should be submitted uh, so that everybody can prepare and, and give them in advance. Thank you. Thank you very much to Joel. And if I uh, may now give the floor to the United States, Rogers Ankness, if I've got it correctly, you have raised your hand. Please, the floor is yours. Um, I apologize. Um, that is actually a legacy hand. I'm sure it's not lazy, isn't it a legacy hand? Or, but uh, we are inventing new words. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if there was a hand up by Nigeria, uh, if that was a mistake. Um, but if I have overlooked any other hand, um, please uh, simply alert me. Um, but I am looking carefully to see. Um, we have, we have. Um, just over 10 minutes left. This has been a very deep and a detailed discussion. And um, so thank you also very much to both Iran and to China for, for raising some of the deeper issues and with the questions also prompting others to be able to share their deeper questions as well and perhaps begin reflecting on that to um, to inform each other of each other's perspectives. Um, I wonder if there is any other comment or reflection or any last addition that you may want, any of you may wish to raise uh, in these, in our last 10 minutes together. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, I do see a hand, so I will give the floor to Toshi Yoshizaki in one second. And if I may also recall that um, uh, the suggestion was made that as these questions are really quite fundamental, and I think there were two, uh, particular two speakers that raised some of these deeper questions, it would be very helpful if we could have them in writing to share just for contemplation again 
in the online workspace and for uh, informing the others as well, if that would be agreeable with the with the two respective speakers. If I have missed another question that was raised, um, uh, please, of course, assume that invitation is to you as well. But let me now turn over the floor to Toshi Yoshizaki, please. Thank you, Claudia, and uh, I'm sorry to take the floor again. I just want to uh, echo uh, the, the intervention from the U.S. Greeks on the, how we interpret the monitoring guidance, the role of the monitoring guidance, and also how, uh, to what extent we use the, the data on the emission and release uh, inventory or other uh, data. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, repeat that, that the monitoring guidance should not be something to exclude the data, uh, the monitoring data to be submitted. Uh, and uh, in addition to the monitoring data, we had better to use the modeling data as well. And uh, I think there would be some uncertainty both in the in the monitoring data and the modeling data, but they would provide uh, useful uh, observation, even if they have a, a certain level of uncertainty. And we should not close the door uh, at the beginning of uh, the uh, effectiveness evaluation cycle. And uh, uh, as for the emissions and releases inventory, uh, I agree with, with the, the the other parties uh, in that the only the parties data would not be the main sources. And uh, uh, for example, as for the releases data, uh, not for emissions data, but releases data, the, the convention would uh, require uh, the parties to provide the releases, releases inventory only for relevant sources not covered by other articles. So uh, the, the inventory of releases submitted by the, by the parties would not be a sufficient source of information uh, to assess the overall effectiveness of uh, the convention. So uh, we support uh, to include all the available data on the emissions and releases. Thank you. I just wanted to add these comments. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, very clear and, of course, very important to consider the sources um, that will inform the effectiveness evaluation of the convention. Is there any other hand, any other contribution, um, any other clarification any of the speakers would like to make? Or is there any other question, small or big, uh, that anybody else may still have um, that they are contemplating? While you think about that for a moment, I, I would like to, because I don't think it is visible to all of you, uh, just uh, inform that we have more than a hundred attendees once again for the consultations. This was the same on Tuesday, and we have, if I counted correctly, uh, certainly about 34 parties: uh, Argentina, Belgium, Burundi, Brazil, Canada, Chile, China, Colombia, Costa Rica, Denmark, Finland. Indonesia, Iran, Kuwait, Germany, Guinea-Bissau, Japan, Ireland, Mexico, the Netherlands, Nigeria, Norway, Romania, Saudi Arabia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Sri Lanka, Sweden, the Philippines, the United Kingdom, and the United States. We also have the EU, Mongolia, Guyana, Tanzania, and Guatemala, if I have counted them all correctly. So just for your sense of participation, uh, perhaps not in a speaking way in the conversation and your consultation, but uh, certainly in a listening way. If there are no specific other questions at this time, um, in some ways as Secretariat, we would be 
very keen to know how else and how more we can assist you as parties further um, uh, in your preparation uh, in this intervening time. And if there's any other um, advice or request or, or item you need from us, please either let us know now or let us know afterwards. Uh, perhaps something that might only come to you afterwards and after your own debriefs in this meeting, just to say we as Secretariat would be extremely happy to support the parties in this uh, important consideration. And um, as also mentioned, of course, effectiveness evaluation also includes um, some other areas of work. We did not speak very much on indicators today, but Mr. Torabi explained some of the particular comments from his government's perspective. I'd like to recall that on Tuesday, of course, Matt Levitt from the United Kingdom made the comment about how to, uh, his, his government's comment about the approach to concluding on the indicators that have been developed so far. And all of those are, of course, in the add one document with the respective inf. Uh, attached to it. So there's also that matter of work. And then lastly, and in no way, in no way leastly, the, all of the work that has been done uh, and is continuing to be done and a number of speakers, Terry Keating and others have spoken about that regarding the monitoring guidance and the continued work, including, of course, the deadline tomorrow, uh, the 28th, uh, for, the sub for some of the supplemental information. Um, with that, may I just reiterate perhaps the invitation to either the questions that were asked today to receive them in a form of writing to be able to share on the workspace and or if there are other questions that you wish to have clarifications on or other comments or let me say additional comments to the ones you have already either submitted or made here this could even include reflections after this particular session and these two sessions together. Please feel free to get in contact with us, in contact with me if you need, or if you need to speak to any other specialist or expert in the Secretariat, do let us know. If you need to contact a particular party and didn't quite uh, get the name from who to contact, if we can be helpful, we shall be happy to facilitate that. And um, with that, unless I see any other request either by hand or any other question in the chat? I think we might be able to say that we have finished the conversation that we had today, finished, um, not finished, <laughs> that we bring to an end today's um, uh, consideration and uh, on these uh, submissions and the bigger issues underlying the fundamentals underlying effectiveness evaluation. And if I may use the last minute just for other information related to Minamata Secretariat work right now and also and especially uh, in the run up to uh, COP 4.2, I'd just like to reiterate that um, the registration process has opened as our executive secretary uh, Monica Stankiewicz outlined when we began on Tuesday to join us in person and online if if so wished. Um, uh, the registration process has opened. Uh, we trust all national focal points and others have received everything they need to be able to begin their registration process and contemplate their delegations. Um, we are about to receive more information also from the host government, which we'll make available as soon as it is uh, has reached us to support your further decisions, of course, on all of the arrangements that are required to travel to Bali at this more fragile time. And um, furthermore, we are beginning next week a set of document briefings. Um, on all of the topics that are before COP 4.2. So please have a look at the notifications sent out or our main uh, website. Um, the Geneva lunchtime, se lunchtime sessions on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday will be used to present 
all of the overview of all of the COP documents uh, that are going to be considered at COP 4.2, of course, not only effectiveness evaluation. We also have um, the week thereafter a set of regional meetings, and uh, we trust you have all the information at hand for that or to let us know if your delegations need any other information in that regard. And with that, I have really taken up every minute we have um, booked our view and um, we look forward to continuing to support you and wish you a very good morning, day or evening wherever we might find you today. Until next time, and on behalf of all my colleagues at the Secretariat, goodbye and stay safe. Bye-bye.